Good morning, church. Good morning to you. Greetings and welcoming to one and all, whether you're here in this building this morning or joining us via the internet. Greetings in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are here this morning to lay our burdens aside, and as we approach Thanksgiving, those of us that are children of God, realize from whence comes our help. Our help comes from the Lord, and our response is thanksgiving. And as we gather today for worship, I would encourage you to lay your burdens aside and be thankful for all God has given you. Everything that we have, God has bestowed upon us. So let's stand now and, and read responsively from Psalm 95. Oh, come! Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. And all God's people said, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Amen. Well, good morning again. And So um, this morning I want to share some good news with you. Um, two things real quickly. And um, the first is that um, we have a team right now in the midst of everything that's going on. They're preparing to go to Haiti. And so they're, they're preparing to go and take the message of the gospel to people who've never heard it. And so they're meeting um, after our second service in the, outside the lobby in the hospitality room. And so if you have any interest in that, you can join them right after the second service to gain some more information about that trip. But another thing, um, some good news is that in the midst of everything that's happened this year, Brushy Creek has been able to give 100% of the budgeted monies that we set aside for missions to missions this year. Every, every penny has been able to go toward missions. And, and that's good news because that helps keep missionaries on the field. 
And so uh, the last several weeks, we've been hearing from missionaries and those who are uh, dear to our hearts. And so this morning, we're going to give you the opportunity to hear for a cu- from a couple more who are dear to our hearts, uh, Alan and Tricia Shute. Uh, they are longtime Brushy Creek members, and they are now serving the Lord in uh, Taiwan with the IMB. And so they're going to tell us a little bit about what God's doing in their lives when over there in Taiwan and, so, and just how you can pray for them and that kind of thing. So would you welcome them to Brushy Creek this morning? Well, good morning, everyone, and just thank you very much for having us this morning. We are Alan and Tricia, and we served in I am with the International Mission Board in Taiwan from late 2017 or early this year, and we are looking forward to going back early next year to serve for another two years. Give me the next slide there. Um, we serve with the IMB missionaries in their East Asian affinity. Thank you. And um, in what is then called the Master's Program. And the Master's Program is a program designed for seniors like us who um, have the opportunity to serve God in a partially paid format where the company would provide us housing and transportation and we were responsible for all the other costs. And thankfully, we give thanks for Brushy Creek to support us financially by paying our, um, our medical bills during that time, our medical insurance. So we really are truly thankful. And we are really thankful for Brushy Creek and other churches that are supporting the Lottie Moon Christmas offering because starting next year when we go back, it'll be a fully funded program that we are part of. So that's really wonderful. East Asia consists of only a few countries. It consists of Japan, uh, South Korea, Mongolia, China. It includes the island of Taiwan and the city of Hong Kong, which of course is now part of China. But all of that makes up a whopping 1.7 billion people to be ministered to. Now, Taiwan is a small island, about half the size of uh, South Carolina, and it sits on the southeast corner of China. It has 23.5 million people, with 7.4 million of those people living in the city of Taipei. I'll go on next. Now, we uh, went there, of course, as... Um, missionaries to serve with the diaspora folks. And the diaspora people are all the people of China that live outside of mainland China. And we went there specifically to be the administrative support for the diaspora leader who serves all the people of the diaspora. Now, the diaspora people include the people that live in Taiwan, but it also includes the folks that live in, say, Western Canada, U.S., Europe, Southeast Asia, Africa, Middle East, and even South America. So we have missionaries in all of those places, or almost all of those places. So we have a lot of people to support. And we went there as admin supporters for our boss so that we could help him uh, with any tasks that would just make it easier for him to, pers- to uh, have more time to do his own work. So uh, one of the things as masters is when we go there, we don't go with two or three years of seminary. We don't go there with two or three years of language studies. So we just jump right in. But we had the opportunity still to teach classes in English. We taught English as a second language throughout our time there, whether it was at university or part of this church. Or in this case, we're showing a slide of teaching English as a second language as an English class during public school English time. And we would go around Christmas time and Easter and just present the gospel story. We would use missionaries on short-term mission trips like Americans that would come over to teach English. And the schools really appreciated these English classes. The students appreciated them, the teachers, and even the principals appreciated us coming over and teaching these lessons. Next slide. So what can you do? Well... There are three things that you could do. You can certainly pray for the missionaries. You can pray for all the IMB missionaries, but specifically you can be focusing your prayers upon our missionaries that have come from our church, the Hepners, us, and along with several other people that have gone to support the mission program around the world. And you can give to support the mission program. You can give through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. As I mentioned, a lot of the money that IMB gets through um, is through the I am through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and 100% of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes to support the international missions. So you can give, and you can go on short-term mission trips and other trips. 
I know this church sponsors both short-term mission trips domestically and internationally. So those are available. You can go on midterm trips like Tricia and I you know, because you don't need seminary or a degree and you don't need to have the language study. Or you can even think about going on long-term mission trips. And then that would require a degree in seminary and uh, language study. But IMB really has different programs that help you out on that. So we are truly thankful for your support for us. We want to uh, give thanks again for the, your kindness and support. And I'm just going to end with a word of prayer and introduce um, Pastor Tony here. Lord, we just give thanks that we had this opportunity to uh, share with you through uh, serving in Taiwan. We give thanks that you were providing opportunities for us to go back. And we ask that you continue to bless this church and the support from missionaries around the world. Bless now Tony as he comes forward. May we have open hearts to hear, uh, to listen and hear and to obey your word that you put upon his heart now. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. that is that better okay good uh good morning grab your bibles if you would turn to revelation chapter 2 and we're going to be in verse 18 and we're going to dive right in let me just quickly say before we read the scripture this morning that um, i'm thankful that the imb has made it possible for people to be able to go and serve in a lot of places without the necessity of a seminary degree i think there needs to be people um, I mean, I'm, I'm in education, so I'm obviously in favor of it, but I'm also in favor of life experiences, commitment to the call, and the ability to share the gospel to people and to, for people to have opportunities to do that where it's not always necessary that they have to have gone through the seminary process. It just, it eliminates too many people from service that are capable if, if you do that. So I think the IMB is on the right track and doing some of these programs that allow people to go without that requirement for specific purposes. All right, let's stand together. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. We have uh, four churches to go, counting today. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance. And that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds." And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations." And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as also I have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. You know, we've seen a progression as we begin in Ephesus, if you've kind of watched as we've walked through these letters together. You've seen a progression of what happens when we lose our first love. I mean, we could go all the way back to Ephesus and say, the problems in Pergamum, the problems that we're going to look at today in Thyatira are the result of the loss of the first love, the deep love that we have for God. Because idol worship is always preceded by a loss of focus on who God is. That's what allows an idol, and by the way, please clear your mind for a second, 
of people bowing down to wooden images and iron images. and That's not what we're talking about. That may be what they were engaging in, but idol worship is by definition anything that we exalt above the love and devotion that we have for God. So we don't, we don't bow down. I, I, I'm sure that if I came to your house, although I can't come right now because of COVID probably, but if I came to your house, I'm sure you're not, you don't have a little room in your house dedicated to some idol where you're going in there and building a fire and bowing down. I just, I'm just confident that that's not happening. But idols creep in. They don't charge in, they creep in. You know, I, I, I think about the whole concept of our cell phones and metadata that leaves a digital trail. Now, you know this, right? I mean, if anybody wants to find you, if you have a smartphone, you're leaving a digital trail. And they can track you based on your digital trail. I mean, when I got up this morning and I got in the car to come to Brushy Creek, my phone pinged. I took a look at it, and it told me how long it was going to take to get here and how far it was. And the, it showed me the way. The little map popped up. So what's going on? I mean, I didn't set my phone to tell me that I need to go to Brushy Creek. My phone knows what I do on Sunday morning because my digital trail has built up to the point that my phone can track and tell me not only where I've been but what I'm going to do. Now, this afternoon, when I go home and eat lunch, probably about 3 o'clock, I'll decide I'm going to the gym. And when I get in the car, my phone's going to tell me how far it is. Same thing, I've... I've left my digital footprints behind, and my phone is able to know where I am. And it, by the same token, just as our phones leave a digital footprint that reveals who we are, well, where we are, because we are spiritual beings, our thoughts and our actions leave a spiritual footprint that relates to who we are and where we are in our relationship with God. So the people who made up the church at Thyatira, as we look at them, we can see that they were a people who had compromised to the point of making idolatry a common part of their life. It had become not something that, that was occasional. It had become a practice. And see, that's, what's happened. That's, what ha that's what happens when compromise begins. We talked a lot about compromise last week when we talked about Pergamum because it was the compromising church. Ta Thyatira is about five years downstream from Pergamum on the road to exactly what happens when we compromise. They become a tolerant church because compromise naturally leads to tolerance of things that God has said we should never be involved in. Once we're on the road of compromise, if we don't get off, we always reach the place where idolatry becomes common practice. Rarely does a person or a culture get up one morning and say, you know what? I'm walking away from the principles and the practices that led me to where I am right now. I'm just going to abandon them all. We just don't wake up one day and make that decision. But what we do is we make little decisions over time that lead us into a place where we become comfortable with our own idols. We gradually allow ourselves to love something or many somethings more than we love God. And that's what leads to the problem. All right, let's take a look at the background. We know that Thyatira was located about 40 miles southeast of Pergamos. It was established by none other than Alexander the Great. It was set up as a Macedonian colony after Alexander destroyed the Persian Empire. It was famous for the manufacture of purple dye. In fact, we find a reference to Thyatira in Acts chapter 16, verse 14 and 15. We know that Lydia, who came to know Christ under Paul's ministry, was someone who was from Thyatira. And the Bible says her and her whole household believed. And so since we don't have a record of evangelism taking place in Thyatira, we do make, we, it, it's possible that Lydia is responsible, that Lydia and her family went back home and the gospel began to grow in Thyatira. Now Lydia would have been long gone by now from the time of the book of Acts, but her witness and the witness of her household had grown to the point 
possibly, and, and it could have been that Thyatira became an outgrowth of Paul's ministry at Ephesus. There are a lot of ways the gospel could have been planted. But it's certain that Lydia, because we know she was converted and she was from that city, and that's where her business was, had a hand in what was taking place there. Thyatira was home to multiple trade guilds that were tied to pagan worship. Now this is an important thing for us to understand because in, a, in the city of, of, of Thyatira, if you wanted to work, you needed to understand that your trade guild likely merged with pagan worship. So if you're going to have a job, you're going to have to at least pay some homage to the gods that were tied to the trade guilds. Work, the ability to take care of yourself meant that you, that, that you had to blend in with the work environment. So the pressure to conform in Thyatira would have been incredible. Not only was it a pressure to conform to religious beliefs, but that pressure had the added portion of being the pressure to conform if you actually wanted to be able to work, if you wanted to be able to be recognized in society. And that tells us that the forces of culture can be extremely powerful influencers in the little decisions we make every day. I mean, I'm sure these people didn't get up one morning, like we said earlier, and go to work and decide that they were going to compromise the teaching of Jesus. But the pressure of the trade guild where they were employed constantly was building and the little decisions they made to go along with whatever idol worship or whatever compromise there was just continued to build in Thyatira. You know, we want to hold on to our positions, don't we? We want to hold on to our position in the culture. We want to hold on to our jobs. And sometimes, just like in the world today, we, can, we know I could give you examples of people who have lost their job because they refused to compromise the teaching of the gospel. They would say something on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or somewhere else, make a public statement that ran counter to what a particular employer or corporation would be in favor of, and that could put pressure on you to where you don't get promoted or perhaps you even lose your job. We see that in the world today. Pressure in the culture to conform. And you know, it's, it doesn't take a whole lot of pressure. Anybody remember Candid Camera? Some of you are going to remember Alan Funt and Candid Camera. You realize that that show started way back in 1948? Well, one of the, it was the first reality show. I mean, TV had, we think we invented something in the 21st century. Reality TV or in the end of the 20th century. But it, the truth is, when television was young, you had Candid Camera. And they had one particular program where they had this poor guy get on an elevator, and he did what everybody does when you get on an elevator. You face the front. Well, the next floor, three actors that were paid got on the elevator and faced the rear. And the guy was standing there, and he was real, it was real awkward, and he didn't know what to do. And I mean, you're standing there alone. You're facing the door like God intended, and, and, and there's people getting on the elevator. They're facing the rear. What's up with that? Elevator stops at another floor, doors open, another person gets on and joins the four, they're standing there facing the rear. Every single person they put in that elevator turned at that point and faced the rear of the elevator. Why? Pressure, social pressure, being uncomfortable at being different. We see a modern example with Drew Brees, NFL quarterback. You know, he gave an interview. And all he did was say, they asked him, what are you going to do when the NFL starts kneeling because of the national anthem? And Drew Brees said this. He said, I would never kneel when the national anthem is played because of my grandfathers. One grandfather fought in World War II in the Marines. The other grandfather was in the Army. And they sacrificed to protect us so that we would have the ability to express ourselves in this country. They protected us from the the German, Japanese, Italian tyranny that would have rolled over us if they hadn't been willing to stand on the wall. And so, no, I, I, I'm not going to kneel because that's disrespectful to the country, to the flag, and the memory of my two grandfathers. 
perfectly logical. Within 24 hours, he was issuing an apology. He, he couldn't kneel enough to overcome the social pressure that came from his the players that were on his team, some of the coaches, and from millions of people that he had never met who went after him and attacked him because of his opinion. And, and it took 24 hours for him to abandon something that was perfectly legitimate, which is the desire to honor the sacrifice and the bravery of people in his family. So cultural pressure, it was happening in Thyatira. It was happen it's happening in our world today. When, when, when the pressure to conform can be brought by the culture, it can be overwhelming. But when our desire for the approval of the culture is greater than our affection for God, that's when idols are going to creep in. Things that we put before our love for God. Now let's look at the description of Jesus. His title, Son of God. Do you know why Jesus showed up as Son of God in Thyatira? We don't see that title in the other churches. Why here? It's very simple. In Thyatira, one of the most popular idols was an idol to Apollo. Apollo was the son of Zeus. And so the Son of God shows up and says, By the way, there's only one Son of God. His name is not Zeus. And I'm the son of God. And so it's a reminder. It's a, it's a refocus. The anchor that holds us in place when the lure of things have the potential to become gods that become overwhelming in our belief, that anchor is that there is one indisputable God. And he has one son. And his name is Jesus. And we may, we may say, well, that's pretty elementary, preacher. I mean, I think we're beyond that at Brushy Creek. You know, we, we get it. We, we know there's only one God, and we know that Jesus is his son. I know you know it, but is your anchor tied to it in a way that holds you in place when the world comes along and says, here are things that need to get between you and the Son of God and God himself? Because it's not just our belief in who or what God is, it is who God is in us, personally. If you've been reading the devotionals that Jim and I do, you know that I've been going through the names of God in the devotionals that I've been doing. You think about those names. Elohim, powerful God. El Elyon, God most high. El Shaddai, almighty God. Adonai, Lord. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord who sanctifies. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Roi, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Shama, the Lord is present. He is the creator of all things. He spoke the universe into existence. You know, I wish what I speak had some power. But I've discovered... That, you know, I can say a lot of things sometimes. It doesn't necessarily mean those things are going to come to pass. Can you imagine being the being who speaks or whose thought process is all that's necessary to bring everything that we know anything about into existence? God spoke the stars into place. That's an incredible thought. And there's no place for anything in our life other than to be anchored in the understanding of who God is and the understanding of who Jesus is as his only son. Jesus comes as one with flames of fire, penetrating every thought, seeing our every action. In fact, if you look back at the scripture, notice it says that uh, there's a place where Jesus speaks of being able to see. In verse 23, it says, you know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. That's where the flames of fire come in with his eyes. His ability to know everything that we've ever thought. He pierces and looks through who you are. And you know what's amazing about that? He loves you. And he loves me. Even though he can see every bad thing that runs through my mind. He knows my attitudes when my attitude stinks about something. The Lord sees it maybe even before I hold the attitude. And yet his love and his mercy and the willingness of him to give us opportunity after opportunity to repent is an incredible thing for us to behold. And it should mean that we should never 
be willing to put anything before God. All right, his feet described as fine brass. That just, you know what that means? You ever, you ever think about being kicked by a brass boot? Whew. Fine brass. It just means he's able to trample out all things that are in opposition to him. Listen, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus is love. Jesus is mercy. Jesus is forgiveness. But Jesus is also perfect righteousness and justice. And here's what we need to understand. He takes sin very seriously. We don't sometimes. We need, to, we, we need to see these pictures. I think it's important for the church today in particular because we tend in the church today to forget the majesty of God, the soul sonship of Jesus. We tend to forget the depth of sin and how the depravity of sin breaks the heart of God and God wants to forgive. But know this, when he comes, sin will be judged. We're in a window of opportunity right now to be forgiven. His mercy endures forever. His loving kindness from generation to generation. But his justice will not be denied. And so Jesus reminds them of that with this description of his feet of fine brass. Let's look at their works. The Bible says that their, the commendation that they get is that the later works are greater than the first. In other words, the, the, the amount of their works was, ex, was expanding. Where they started, they were actually doing more than when they started. But do you know what that means? You know, our works alone do not indicate the depth of commitment that we have to Christ. We can do good works and still drift away from the central focus of who Jesus is in our life and be susceptible to idols. You know, that you, you remember Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. But, and, and then there'll be those who say, but didn't we, do, didn't we do miracles in your name? Didn't we do many works in your name? And didn't we do... So the resume that's given in Matthew 7 is a resume that says, but we did good stuff. And here Jesus comes to the church at Thyatira and says, you've done good stuff. The stuff you're doing now is better than the stuff you did at first. But it doesn't indicate a transformed heart. Good stuff can happen, and yet still the main thing has not happened in terms of the focus that we have on God. Look at their love. It says they were commended for having something the church at Ephesus left. That's incredible. The church at Ephesus didn't have love. The church at Thyatira was commended for their love, but they were practicing love toward each other, supporting each other, which is an important expression of God's love. But here's what we need to remember. Sometimes our love can actually, our love for others, can get between us and God. How does that work? When somebody that we love is in sin, somebody that we desperately love, has embraced rebellion against God. Sometimes we're tempted to defend the sin because of the love that we have for the person. And can I just tell you that that's not love. We, we're, not, we're not being loving towards someone when we think we are, when we say the sin you have embraced is okay because you embraced it and I love you, so I'm going to defend it. That, that's not what God says. We're, we we're, we're telling a person essentially that they're not going to be held accountable. And that's not an act of love. Look at the, the Bible says that Jesus commended them for their service. That would have been their hospitality. So they were willing to serve each other, but just like as love for anything more than we love God can cause us to compromise with sin, our desire to accept and tolerate, uh, tolerate each other can lead us to ignore or embrace the sin of others. You know, Josh McDowell talked about this. He talked about positive tolerance and negative tolerance. He said there was a time in America where we were negatively tolerant, which means we were 
we, we, could, we could love and accept a person and be negative toward the things that that person has embraced. And as long as we accepted them and didn't come after them personally, then we were considered tolerant. But now we live in a culture of positive tolerance, which means you can't say, I've accepted the person unless you accept what they have embraced. And if what they embrace is something that is opposed to the Word of God, then we can't be tolerant or considered tolerant until we take the whole package. And that's, that's not what God's Word says. God's Word doesn't allow us to do that. They were also committed for their faith and their patience. Let's look at the re rebuke. They tolerated the teaching of Jezebel. Now, Jezebel was a real person, that, but that probably wasn't her real name. There's a point being made here. Jezebel was married to Ahab. If you go back and look at the story, Jezebel was the problem. Ahab was just a weak king. He just did whatever Jezebel basically told him to do. She ran the show. And her whole purpose was to mix the true teaching of God with the false teaching of Baal and to bring those things together and to force the Hebrews to ultimately accept. She didn't care if they wanted to say good things about the God of Israel, but what she wanted was them to acknowledge that Baal was the God of the people as long as she was the queen. So this teacher, this prophetess in, in, in Thyatira was telling the people that it's no big deal to mix their worship of God with the demands of of the culture and that's the same instruction that comes from a lot of churches today now look I'm I don't like criticizing other churches and I, I would never criticize them in public or from the pulpit by name because I don't think this don't think that's my place but I will tell you that I know of churches right now within a few miles miles of here that that the message has been compromised because the mix of the demands of the culture has come in and has been mixed with the teaching of God's Word. That's what Jezebel was doing, and, and God condemned it. He said that's the main problem at the church in Thyatira. But here's the thing. She broke down all barriers of moral separation with evil. You remember the movie Troy? You know, it's, it's based on the, the, the poem of Iliad, uh, poem of Iliad, the Iliad, which is the poem of, a poem of Homer, and it's based on the fact that Troy, Troy's walls were so high and so powerful that the Greeks couldn't get by. They couldn't get through. So they, they made the Trojan horse. It was a gift. It was a, a gift of peace. It was a peace offering. And they opened the gates and pulled in their own destruction because what was peace was actually a setup to destroy the Trojans, and it worked. And that's what the, that's what the church is doing today if we open the door to make peace with those who say that we just need to go along with what the culture teaches. If we compromise and become that, we become Thyatira. Because that's what they were doing. And that is essentially the idol worship of our generation. What was going to happen? Well, first of all, we need, to, we need to realize here again is the mercy of God on display. It's truly amazing. Even though she was doing these things, the Bible says God gave her a chance to repent. And notice what he says about those who were following her. Unless they repent. Wow. Unless. It's one of the biggest words in the Bible. Because it's opportunity. Unless is a window. It's the opportunity for us to line up with who God is once we've gotten out of line with the, and gotten in line with the culture. All we have to do is repent, and God will accept. God will forgive. God is like the prodigal, the, the father of the prodigal son who's looking and hoping that his son is going to rise and come home. That's what he wants from us. He wants us, if we drift, if we go in the direction, if we become those who embrace the idol of cultural approval over the worship of Almighty God, Jesus says, repent, come home, be forgiven, be restored. And those who overcome, those who repent, or those who don't follow the way of 
the teaching of Jezebel, what's the promise to the overcomers? They will rule over the nations during the millennial reign. They will receive Christ as the morning star. Let me, let me just say this. The things that idols promise, they never deliver. Put, put that, tattoo that on your Baptist brain. The thing, I don't know why I put Baptist in there, because we have Baptist brains, I guess. The things that idols promise, they never deliver. The things that we desire, if we desire them according to the promises of God, we will receive. What did these people in these trade guilds want? They wanted to have their position. They wanted to keep their job. They wanted to keep their place in the culture. What does God promise to the overcomers? Oh, not only will you have position, but you will rule and reign. But you will rule and reign according to to the promise and the teachings of God. Always remember this. What are the deep things of Satan that are talked about here? The deep things of Satan started in the Garden of Eden. It was when the serpent convinced Eve that God was lying to her. That's the deep things of Satan. Because the serpent made Eve believe that God was holding something back. The serpent said, God told you you would die, you will not die. A direct contradiction. Embrace me is what the serpent was saying. Because God is raining on your parade. God's trying to destroy your true happiness. So follow me in the garden and things will be better for you. And Eve believed the lie. That's the deep things of Satan. It's when, it's when the culture comes in and says, you're wrong about this teaching. We've got it figured out. We know what true love is. We know, again, that love means you can love anybody and it doesn't matter what kind of relationship you have as long as it's a loving relationship. And we see by what Jesus says to the church at Thyatira that that's not true. Love has to be a holy love, a righteous love that leads to repentance and restoration. What's going so the morning star, Christ is the morning star, that just simply means in the darkness in Thyatira, which the culture would have been extremely dark with these trade guilds and people attached to them and being pressured to compromise. Very dark. In that darkness comes the one who lights the way, the morning star. That's Jesus himself. We need that today. In the darkness of our culture, we need Jesus, the morning star, his presence to light our way, to inform our decisions, and to cause us to be the light that God has called us to be, according to Matthew chapter 5. You know, you know how I like to tie things to movies. I'm just a movie buff. I confess. In the movie Apollo 13, Pretty dramatic stuff, right? You got Fred Hayes, you got Jack Swigert, you got Jim Lovell. They're on the way to the moon. The service module blows up because of a spark that ignited the oxygen. And all of a sudden, they've got to move into the Aquarius, which is the lunar landing vehicle, as a lifeboat. And they've got to slingshot around the moon, and they've got to stay alive for four days and get back to Earth when everything is just malfunctioning everywhere. And you know, in the movie, it's pretty dramatic that they have to make a course correction and they have to fire the lunar lander's engines to make that course correction. And oh, the drama of it. That's one of the most dramatic portions of that movie. Did you know in real life that they had to do that several times? It wasn't just once. Something was pushing them off course the entire time they were coming back from the moon. And every 12 to 14 hours, they had to light up those rockets in that lunar lander to get back on course. Why? Because if they weren't on course when they got back to Earth, they would skip off the atmosphere or they would come in so steep that they'd burn up and die. The course was narrow. Narrow is the way that leads to heaven and leads to life. 
That's the path we have to find. And the pressure of the world is constantly pushing against us to get us off course so that we miss the goal and we don't make it, so that we don't persevere. And you know, when Lovell had to fire those rocket engines, he had to have a fixed point in space because the computer was down. You know, the, the digital footprint that we talked about, there was no digital footprint. The computer wouldn't work. They couldn't power it up because they couldn't sp- supply the power. So when it was time to adjust the course, they had to depend on a fixed point in space to make sure they were on course. Today, our fixed point in the universe is our relationship with God, and it's the power of the Holy Spirit that is brought to bear when we are fixed on that point. That's what keeps us on course as the culture pushes and tries to drive us outside of the safety of the corridor of our relationship with Jesus. Let's stay fixed. Stay focused on the one, the morning star, who can light our way and through the power of the Holy Spirit keep us on course. Would you stand with me for just a moment, please? Father, I pray in these moments that as we have an opportunity to reflect on what your word has said, that that reflection would include our understanding of the forces of the culture around us that are trying to push us into a place to embrace those things that are not right according to your word. And that is a strong push. And yet, Lord, being fixed upon you, the one who spoke the universe into creation, the one whose son whose only son has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished brass. When we look at the power of who you are, we know we have the power to stay on course if we're fixed on you. God, help us to push away from idolatry and to only embrace the truth. In Jesus' name.